being in a public hearing in the Lumbister School Committee. We are, it's uh, 704. We are at the Lumbister High School Auditorium. I would ask that you all join me in a salute to the flag. that again. It was like the wave. Okay. Okay. For the logistically, we have a couple of pages of people that would like to speak. There is the microphone they're going to use is where is it right there? And just your name and address for the record, please. And a um, couple of house rules. Everyone has two minutes, so we can give everyone an equal chance to speak. So two minutes. Ten seconds before the two minutes are up, you'll get a warning. And then um, we'll proceed on. And that way everybody gets a chance. Um, please, everyone use respect tonight. And um, this way we get a chance to listen to everybody and everybody's respectful of each other's opinions because it's a room full of people and not everybody's going to agree. So we ask you to do that. So we'll, we'll, we'll just speak to the process right now and then the superintendent is going to make a presentation. All right, good evening, everyone. No, I'm just going to speak to the process. Oh, okay, go ahead. So, what we're doing is we have a um, net school spending budget, which is the required amount that the city has to spend on education in the school department. That is the baseline. I know people have been talking about cuts. Um, it, it's proposed cuts. So, if we were to have a net school spending budget, this is um, the presentation the superintendent is about to give will be that amount. But that's not going to be the amount. That's if we were to have a net school spending budget. From there, um, the budget will be um, submitted, as is all city budgets will be submitted to the mayor's. And then I'll sit down as the mayor, and we take whatever revenue sources we have, all of the budgets, uh, all of the increases, wherever they might be, and we put a proposed budget together, and then that gets submitted to the city council. Um, so this is in terms of um, the school school committee passing a budget and in that budget will be two lines one will be a net school spending a required amount that needs to be spent and then another column of add-ons so if we have three hundred thousand dollars that will go above net school spending where will those funds be spent if there's four hundred thousand or five hundred thousand those columns will be specific the school committee will specifically list each one of those items in a list of priority so Everyone, transparency, everyone will know exactly what the priorities are of the school committee above the required amount. So everybody, whether we agree or not, the school committee will pass that. And that's the budget that the mayor will get, and we'll put the budget together. We'll take whatever priorities there are, whatever funding there is available, and we'll put the final budget together, and then we'll go to the school, uh, we'll go to the city council. For the sake of tonight's, I know people are using the word cuts, for the sake of the conversation tonight, it's creating a baseline then we work from there. Okay? Superintendent? All right. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, this evening, thank you very much for uh, turning out and thank you for your continued support of the uh, Levinson Public Schools. We just want to give you a, a quick overview. Um, this is a uh, presentation that was provided to the school committee last night. We've expanded it a bit so that we uh, can provide you with an overview of uh, the pretty much the state of the schools at this point, and then we can open it up to the public comment. Um, the first uh, thing we just wanted to go over was the district-wide goals. If you could advance the slide, please. Um, not to uh, spend a lot of time on these initial slides, but Lemons to Public Schools focuses on all students. Uh, we have a very uh, sincere partnership with the entire community to enrich the education of all students. 
and we strive to work as efficiently and effectively as we can through the use of the resources that we're provided. Next slide. Um, district improvement plan, we have a bunch of administrators down in front here as well as all of our um, teachers and other educators and essentially these are the district-wide uh, improvement goals that we all operate from and when we set our goals during the course of the year all of these um, objectives are included in individual goals at no matter what level you're at in the school district. So objective one is the implementation of rigorous standards-based curriculum. Objective two, a system for using data to improve instructional practices. And objective three is really a focus on academic and social emotional growth and development of our students. Uh, just a couple of quick snapshots on the next slide as to the success of the Leominster Public Schools. Uh, we have really uh, made some progress over the la last six years as being recognized by both the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, uh, the Commissioner of Education and the Rennie Center for Educational Research and Policy for the innovative programming that's resulted in student success. Uh, we've uh, made great uh, strides as well as we're well known in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts for the work that we do. Our educators have been empowered and this is primarily through joint labor management initiatives uh, to improve curriculum and instructional practice in our classrooms. And the district is continuing to make progress on its long-term goal to increase, uh, increase the rate of proficiency of uh, student reading to meet that grade three uh, uh, policy level of uh, proficiency. And our students continue to impress the community and you'll see this as our seniors are graduating this year and all of the uh, scholarship events and uh, achievement events and, gra and the graduation on uh, June 3rd uh, with their academic, their technical achievements and the application of their skills in the real world. Uh, next slide please, okay. The district has reversed the trend in school choice students. Um, this is one source of our revenue in the district and we switched this um, process this year where we have more students who are attracted to the limits to public schools rather than those who are opting to go to other school districts. So that was a huge important objective that we uh, met during the course of this uh, school year. CTEI, the Center for Technical Education and Innovation, and the Leminster Center for Excellence have been entrepreneurial and have leveraged their autonomies um, as innovation schools to create new revenue sources. And now they can accept students from outside of Leminster on a paid tuition basis. So this is another revenue source for the school district. <coughs> Uh, we have established excellent partnerships with the business community, with nonprofits, with social service organizations, and they support our students through co op and internship opportunities. And we thank the Lemon Red Foundation, the United Way, and the Community Foundation who have been instrumental in the support of our schools and our students. So, overall, our budget objectives really quick. Um, is really to form a uh, collaborative partnership between the school committee, administration, the city to be able to get the budget developed uh, to meet the goal that was given to us to uh, submit a budget for required net school spending. Uh, we also want to be able to continue to sustain the current operations of the school district to maintain the district focus on instructional practice and to meet all the needs of all of our students, including our high needs population. Uh, we've been able to sustain operations for six straight years during my tenure, despite variable and diminishing revenue, primarily from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, uh, by the Chapter 70 formula, but that's not gonna be the case in FY18, and that's why you're all here. Next slide, please. The, just really quickly, this question came up at the school committee meeting last night, so we want to do a quick overview. Chapter 70 foundation formula, not really one of those items that is 
on the top 10 list of any one of you to really understand, but it essentially allocates state resources to every public school district in Massachusetts, and it's done via a uh, formula called the Chapter 70 formula. So it allocates state resources, but it also identifies the required contribution for local municipalities. Uh, it was proposed as part of the Ed Reform Act in 1993. So 24 years later, we're essentially working off of the same formula for these resource allocations. So, and that's supposed to determine the adequacy of equitable education funding across the Commonwealth. Um, not working well, a review commission was established a couple of years ago to perform a thorough review of the formula. They made recommendations for improvement. To date, none of those recommendations have been implemented. And they revolve around health insurance, which is one of those topics you're going to hear about this evening. Special education services to students. Uh, English language learning services to students. Uh, the in dealing with the increasing demographics of low-income students across the Commonwealth, as well as addressing early education. Next slide. So this is in a snapshot of really what the foundation uh, budget numbers are for the uh, City of Lemonster for this particular school year. Uh, foundation budget numbers are in uh, black at the top. The required local contribution, which is identified by the formula, is it uh, the $27.8 million mark for FY18, uh, increase of $325,000. Chapter 78, which is the aid from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, at $44 million. Uh, you can see the increase of $122,000 uh, and the required net school spending at $71.8, which is essentially our goal budget. And that shows an increase to cover all of our increased operational costs for FY18 at $448,210. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Glenn Frado who's our school business administrator, uh, new to the district in uh, this particular school year. And he will go through uh, most of the detail on the financial slides and then turn it back over to me. So, Glenn. Thank you, Superintendent. A few months ago, I was in this auditorium with my granddaughter watching The Little Mermaid. There were many more smiles then than there are right now. Next slide, please. Um, these are the budget challenges we're facing this year. As you saw earlier, previous slide, the total amount of increase allocated to this school district next year by the formula is 440 something thousand dollars. Health insurance alone is going up by $686,340. Um, it's a 6% increase, but frankly, that's a very low increase compared to other districts across the state. So the city, which maintains the health insurance, is doing a great job trying to control that expense. And even doing that great job, that amount of money just for health insurance for employees is more than we'll be getting to increase our budget. At 16% of our total budget is allocated toward health insurance. I won't belabor this, but the formula says we should be spending about $6.8 million next year on health insurance. That's how out of whack the formula is. Student transportation expenses for in-district transportation, the big buses, in-district special education transportation, the small buses, out-of-district transportation, those white vans from Vanpool, and homeless transportation is projected at a 4% increase. It's $195,056 over what we're spending this year, aggregating the total projected transportation expense next year of $5,071,470. It's a lot of money for transportation but it's required, other than the big buses, it's re most of it is required. Next, next slide. Um, for next year, out of district special education tuition expenses will increase by 3.43%, another $190,847, for a total budget amount of $5.7 million. 
Again, getting back to the formula, the formula says you'll be spending about $1.6 million in out-of-district tuitions. Maybe that worked uh, back in 1993, but it no longer works here. And quick point, that $5.7 million is much less than we actually spent six years ago. Fewer students are going to out-of-district placements, more staying within the district. As an FY17, there are no new positions included in this budget, including over a million dollars of positions required in order to be in compliance with special education. There are no new positions in this budget. Next slide. So breaking it down for revenue, the increase in the Chapter 70 from the state, $122,460. That's $20 per student that the state is allowing us to increase. The increase in the local contribution is $325,750. The superintendent mentioned earlier the projected the school choice provides significant funds to this district. Significant. So the increase next year, what we budgeted this year, for school choice students will be $308,000 almost comparable to the requirement by the city. And tuition revenue, we've, that's a low estimate for tuition students that will be attending CTEI next year and Lemonster Center for Excellence. The expense increases for next year, negotiated increases for salaries and wages with our employee unions is a little over $2 million. The increase in health insurance, out of district tuitions and transportation expenses were referenced earlier. So look for a total increase in expenses of $3.1 million. Subtract the revenue of $800,000, you come up with a projected deficit of $2,317,000. Next slide. Here's the $2.3 million. But there are other issues that affect the school budget that many may not be aware of. Um, last year, 2016, we had to use $1.3 million of school choice revenue take care of a shortfall in health insurance. We didn't have enough money in the operating budget to pay for health insurance, so we used an available source of funds, which is school choice. Um, this year, we have a remaining deficit in transportation of $727,850. That's after the city council and mayor have already provided us with $860,000 from free cash to cover transportation. And this year we'll be using $651,000 of school choice to subsidize out-of-district tuition. The amount of money that we had in the budget, plus the circuit breaker revenue of $1.5 million, plus $651,000 allows us to pay for the out-of-district tuitions. So our total projected deficit going into next year based on available funds is just under $5 million. Next slide, please. Um, if we have to cut $5 million, we have to find places, and there just aren't pots of fund that total that amount of money. So the district-wide salary instruction student activity expenses that we're focusing on at this time to meet the net school spending requirement are reducing 96.4 full-time equivalent staff of almost $4 million, a reduction in athletic and extracurricular offerings to students of $297,500, a reduction in instruction materials of 91.5, a reduction in the amount of money we budget for substitute teachers of 100,000, and if 96.4 full-time equivalent staff are no longer here, we won't have to pay their health insurance, which is $1,019,430. So the total reductions are $5,807,000. Just as reference, why is that such a large number for health insurance? If you take the number of full-time employees eligible for health insurance in Lemonster Public Schools, you divide it by the amount of money we spend on health insurance, it goes up to $10,575 per employee. Next slide, please. So the proposed reductions, reduced central office staff again. The superintendent made it very clear to his cabinet and to the school committee that we're focusing on classroom teachers last. So we started out, where can we reduce expenses elsewhere to make sure that the reductions are equitable? Reducing central office staff by 10 employees, reducing secretarial and clerical staff by 11 employees, reducing custodial staff by 28 employees in outsourced custodial <coughs> services, reduced paraprofessionals by eight, reduced tutors by two, reduced nursing by 
0.8 employee, reduce instructional staff by 36.6 employees, reducing classroom expenses by 20%, eliminating agenda books for elementary middle schools, reducing athletics by only offering and budgeting for large city teams, and reducing extracurricular activities offerings by 50%. <clears throat> However, we're cutting 5.8 million, but that's not all the reduction. There are things we have to spend money on when we do that. If we're laying off 96.4 or reducing positions by 96.4 positions, we'll have to pay unemployment expenses. And that number there represents 36% of total salaries by 75% of the people who may be collecting unemployment. That will only be for about a half a year, but it's an expense we have to include in this budget. It won't be included in subsequent year budgets. Reorganization expenses of $328,875. We won't get into the details now, but reducing significant staff, we have to find ways to still get those services covered in a less expensive way. Outsourcing custodians, projected cost of $918,000. Again, we understand that's close to what we'll be saving, but understand the savings also include the health insurance. Just in that line item, it's just under $300,000 additional savings. And outsourcing information technology will cost us approximately 150000 So total additional expenses are $2.5 million. When you net that from the $5.8 million of reductions, the net yield of what we're proposing is just over $3.2 million. Uh, we're also working um, on student transportation costs. Um, member of the school committee, Heather, as a Heather, excuse me, Heather, um, had a committee that worked to try and reduce that cost. It's over $5 million next year. So we're projecting right now, we're working with um, outside consultants under a grant and trying to eliminate at least two buses and reduce the cost of out of district and in district sped services by 5%. It's a small amount, but it's still making an effort to offset the cost of transportation as we move into next year. Back to the superintendent. All right, really quickly, um, we just want to wrap this up by looking ahead. Uh, we just can't look at FY18. We need to look ahead and figure out if there's other ways that we can uh, deal with uh, ongoing increasing expenses and continue to advocate. And we hope that every one of you who are voters in the room will take the time to advocate for changes in the uh, foundation budget and get those review commission recommendations implemented by the, by the Commonwealth. But we'll uh, continue to work in collaboration with the school committee, the city, and the community to minimize this budget impact. Uh, residents, as I said, should take the time to connect with an elected representative and senator and request that they address the recommendations of the foundation budget review commission. Um, the reason that we're putting so much emphasis on this is the fact that this isn't just impacting Lemonster. We have gateway cities and urban, uh, urban districts across the Commonwealth that are just being slammed this year due to the lack of funding coming from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. We have uh, our friends in Brockton with an $18 billion uh, deficit, our friends in Springfield with a $12.5 million deficit, as well as many other districts across the Commonwealth. So um, even though we are dealing with this issue in Lemonster, it's impacting many, many other districts uh, across the state. Uh, trending indicates right now that federal funding um, is going to be impacted in FY19, which is the next fiscal year after we wrap up the budget for this year. And, and administrators here in the district will continue to monitor action at the federal level and advocate accordingly. But this isn't getting any better because as the federal government continues to change their stance on public education, it's going to impact all of us at the state level. Uh, Lemonster Public Schools need to continue to innovate, which we've been doing for six years, improve our operations and identify future budget reductions, while at the same time 
maintaining a strategic objective for student success. So let's take a look at a, a district redesign plan that we have talked to the school committee about and talked to uh, some of the staff about, and it'll give us an idea as to uh, future budget reductions as we uh, move ahead. Next slide, please. Uh, so the redesign plan, real quickly, is to redesign grade pre-K through eight schools uh, to develop inclusive community schools to equitably service all students whether they're English language students, special ed, regular ed, accelerated learners. Uh, conversion of an elementary school to a comprehensive early education center for pre-K and K students and to consolidate all early childhood services. Uh, look at a grade reconfiguration of elementary schools as well as middle schools and we're in working with the mayor and the city, we would love to be able to develop a studio concept school on Lancaster Street. We're at the site of the uh, plastics muse older plastics museum uh, building, as well as to retain existing academic pathways that we currently have in place for grades 9 through 12. Uh, so this is our existing school configuration. The areas that are highlighted are the buildings that are associated with early education. We have a separate school at Bennett, Priest Street, a preschool school location at Samoset Middle. So we have our early education uh, not only uh, scattered amongst every one of the elementary schools, but these other three locations. Next slide. So one option that we're looking at is to look at a pre-K through K uh, building at uh, the Francis Drake location. Uh, make the three other elementary school grades one through four, and then look at uh, Samoset and Skyview as grades five through eight, as well as rotating students through the Lancaster Street Studio School. The next option is to uh, look at the possibility of the pre-KK and Francis Drake uh, reconfiguration of the elementary, but then look at a grade five to six school and at grades seven to eight um, at the middle school level, as well as using the Lancaster Street property. And option three uh, is looking at grade one to eight schools. So uh, those are the three options that we're looking at. Um, if we can um, me, on, just pay attention to the please. remaining slides and we'll wrap this up. Next slide is to retain our grade 9 through 12 pathways, which include the Levinson Center for Excellence, the high school, as well as the uh, CTEI Vocational Technical uh, Innovation School. So, next slide. So the redistrict plan is really focused on early education. I'm gonna turn it over to Jim Riley, our early education uh, director, for a few comments here, and then we'll be wrapping up the presentation. Thanks, Superintendent. I just want to take a moment and address the audience and just talk a little bit about early education. I understand this is a difficult night to be presenting some of this information, but I'm hoping some of these thoughts will resonate as we start to look at this issue over the course of the next year or so. Why is this plan so important to consider? Well, right now research contends that 80 to 90% of brain development occurs between birth and age five. 80 to 90 percent. The majority of that occurs between birth and age three. So if you accept this neuroscience, you should also accept the premise that the achievement gap that we try so hard to address in K through 12 really is more of an opportunity gap for students who don't have the benefit of high level exposure to language rich interactions prior to them entering kindergarten. And it means that these kids, when they enter kindergarten, they're already placed at substantial risk. Researchers from Stanford recently concluded that by age two, okay, children who didn't have these interactions had a six month gap in language processing skills and vocabulary. Six months by age two. What does that look like at age five? This plan seeks to provide young families in Lemonster accessible opportunities to support their children's development and have a meaningful impact on their ability to take full advantage of the quality instruction we currently offer in our K through 12 classrooms. 
Ideally, such a center would become a hub for early childhood activities and programs throughout the city, including expanded partnerships with private providers and existing uh, organizations. So just a couple of the highlights. What it would do is consolidate all the early childhood students currently into a vibrant early childhood environment. It would capitalize on the space available at Francis Drake to install new modular classrooms at the new location and provide expanded space for all students. It would close the pre-street in Bennett schools, whose time has come. It would create a public-private partnership with existing child care centers in Lemonster for efficacy in early childhood teaching and learning, enabling sharing of professional development, best practice, assessments, and so on. It would also create an early childhood education program at CTEI, which would provide those students with the opportunity to be licensed to work in EEC programs, and it would also allow them to have internships um, at the Early Childhood uh, Education Center. It would also create pathways for these students to pursue their education further at Mount Wachusett Community College or Fitchburg State University. And I think lastly, it allows, it allows the district to continue to partner with Strategies for Children and all the good work that currently takes place in the city, um, like the Lemonster uh, Community Coalition, the United Way, the Project Apples Program, the Lemonster Public Library, serving as a source for all these programs to come together and to work with families in the city, whether they attend preschool or not. Thank you, Jim. So this is all future, nothing to really focus on uh, this evening because we're here to discuss the FY18 budget, but we needed to provide the opportunity for you to uh, begin to think as a community of new uh, strategies that we need to place to put in place for future years. Next slide, please. So we'll continue to uh, work on these details. We need the input of all of our educators, all of our community to continue to provide input into this plan and to uh, work out the details. But more of that will be happening in the future. But we don't even look at implementation of this until 18, 19 or beyond. So, next slide. So the other strategic factors um, is the transition of staff. We've dealt with the uh, teachers union on this already uh, and have introduced this to uh, the teachers in each of the schools. Uh, we need to focus on accountability and equity, uh, look at accelerated learning um, being distributed to the elementary schools, uh, ELL students being distributed to uh, individual community schools in the elementary schools. Uh, some redistricting would have to take place. Transportation will change and hopefully save us a tremendous amount of money as we uh, move things around as well as look at school schedules and start times. So we'll continue to focus on expense reduction. Um, there's a lot of components of this that need to come together for successful implementation. I continue to work with the mayor on the use of the Lancaster Street uh, property, which once again is something that we will have to look at from a budget standpoint, and then look at the middle school uh, populations and configurations. So what we've been utilizing um, to this point is providing an opportunity for staff within the Lemonster Public Schools and the community to provide <coughs> feedback and ask any questions. We've been utilizing the uh, tab on uh, the district website, which is listed there. It's called Let's Talk. It's a service through uh, K-12 Insight. And uh, we have received a lot of different input that has been valuable for us as we have moved through the FY18 budget process. So last, um, we are accepting additional feedback and ideas for expense reduction. We're anxious to hear your comments this evening, and the school committee will be deliberating uh, during the course of the uh, rest of the week and the weekend, and they have another meeting next Tuesday, May 30th, at 7 o'clock at CTEI Apple Seeds Restaurant. So thank you for your attention. Thank you. reminded by several of the
school committee members that the presentation on the reorganization and the configuration of the classes and schools in Lancaster Street School is something that is, we've talked about once, and is really sort of futuristic and down the road and shouldn't be confused with tonight's meeting, which is a whole separate sort of matter. So I hope that clears that up. Could you go back to the slide, just one thing. If you could go back to the slide on the sort of budget increases. Shut this one off. Okay. If you could go back to. The slide on the budget increases. So just to get so. Plan A. Can you hear me? Okay. All right. So just so you get sort of an understanding of the, the impact here, because. All these are just numbers, and everyone keeps asking me, so what does this mean? How do, you, how do I relate it to anything? So when we increase taxes on the Prop 2 and a half, the city takes in, and it, and it changes because of the values of property. In the bad economy, when the values dropped, obviously that was, and the, and the, the pool was smaller, that the, the increase in what we raise from Prop 2 and a half increase is lower, obviously. So last year, for instance, and this is just a, just a number I'm sharing with you, so you can put it to, to connect it to the, the, the budget here. A 2.5% increase uh, represents about $1.7 million for fiscal 17. That's the year that we're in. The city's FY17 uh, increased budgetary contribution to schools is $1.6 million. So you can see that in, in relative to the overall increased cost and expenses, um, you can see what that is. I hope that number is fake. It meant nothing other than to add some understanding to what that number means. And I had put out something. We have a, if you, it, on the city's webpage now, we have just a whole pile of information. It's lunas-ma.gov, and it's just a pile of information that sort of breaks all this. Where does the city spend money on the schools? How much? What is the trends? All of that information is, is there. So, we will begin. The public can public. Yes. So for fiscal year 17, are you trying to say that the budget, of six, the foundation budget of 69 million versus the required net of 71.3, the difference of 1.6 came from the increased taxes of 2.5 percent? No, no, that's for that's for last year. Okay. So what's being shown here is, in other words, if we were to go to a net school spending budget, right, the required amount that we need to spend. Which we're not, but for the sake of conversation in a baseline, just a baseline, a starting point. Because we have some decisions to make here. We have to decide of all those things that were proposed cutting, which things in priority would we return back to the budget in priority. That's what you're here to help us with today, hopefully. No, no, it went towards all areas of the school budget. So this year, what is the increase? You mean 16 to 17? Yeah. About, I mean, we're about 448,000. Which is what percent compared to last year? From last year? No, it's more than that. Which is trying to find out if your increase is 16 to 17 is 1.7. Right. On all areas of the budget. In all areas, and I'll, we can kind of explain that later. I have another presentation we can show it if we have time, and that will sort of answer that. Yeah. No, no. Yeah. yeah. No, I have a whole PowerPoint presentation I can show you in that. Was about a million, like um, fifty thousand, not quite a one point one million, but but uh, that much. And then there's other areas of the budget that we increase. 
there were other areas that we got money that weren't part of net school spending. It was, right. They gave us an increase in busing of about 100000 So I don't know if the whole 1.7 went to the schools, but I think a large amount did. This year, the state didn't require that, that for the city to give us that much more. They only required them to give us 300000 Right. And part of it is because we don't have an increase in the amount of students. If you look at the other areas, part of the problem, part of the reason they're getting more money is they have more students. We're not increasing our, our you know, we have very few more students than we did last year, the year before, the year before. And that's part of the problem, why we're not getting more money for the state. And again, the state budget is not complete, so we don't know. These are the other factors that are out there, is we don't totally know what the budget's going to be from the state either. But all of this is just proposed. All of this is just proposed. And it's a starting point. Okay. We'll start off. Sarah Ramram -Ram is, is her name? If I... Everybody can be respectful. You can give everybody an opportunity to speak and share their own thoughts. Hi everyone, my name is Sarah Ramram, and I am here to address the budget cuts that are being presented tonight. Let me just ask a quick question. So this is a budget meeting, right? Um, where is the actual budget? So where is all the money going? Curricular activities together, and I'm very concerned 
as someone who hopes to have kids and raise them in this school district about what opportunities are going to exist for my children. And I understand that this is a really emotional time for all of us, and I, and I, I don't want to admit that the state has been failing us. We have not fixed the foundation budget in 24 years. Nothing costs what it cost in 1993. I was five. <laughs> we need to fix it, but it's gonna be a community solution. One of the things that I hope to work with all of you and all of you on the school committee and in our city government is to pass the fair share constitutional amendment. To fix the foundation budget, it's going to take billions of dollars. Billions of dollars that we do not have and that the state legislature has been hesitant to pull more funds from lower and middle income families. The fair share amendment is the fairest way for us to pull money from people who haven't really been pitching in as much as they should, as much as we have, and make sure that it goes into public education and public transportation. So I look forward to working with all of you to advocate to Governor Baker to make sure that this gets through. <laughs> Gary Zimmerman, and then um, we're going to have to keep the list moving, and Josh Anderson is next, so if Josh, you come up and stand next to Gary, we'll just keep this moving. Name and address, please. Gary Zimmerman, Lynn Haven Road. I just want to say, everything I talk about tonight has nothing to do with the people in any position, whether it's admin or teachers. We have great people in this city. My points are overall spending and accountability. Whether people want to hear it or not, we are all in this situation because of our government and all, at all levels and the unions. Year after year, there is money issues within the school budget. And you have to ask yourself why. Is it the salaries, the great retirement package, early retirement with health care, which is $2.4 million in early retirement health care? Is it the high salaries of the administration? Is it the state education department setting the rules that puts a huge burden on the cities and towns? Is it our government at all levels who would rather put money in their pockets and not more in the schools? What happened to the lottery money that was supposed to help the schools? <coughs> How about LCE, um, some of the spending? Over $600,000 for a private school, having a six-figure principal, having a nurse, a third kids, just doesn't make business sense to me. Again, I'm not saying, saying don't try to help the kids but let's do it in a more accountable way. School choice, is it cost effective or not? How many choice in, how many choice out? Seems pretty simple to figure out. Nice rhyme. <laughs> is it worth the extra kids in the classroom or would it be best for the kids of Leominster to be better off with a smaller classroom? I purchased the payroll records in 2015 which gave me the final payroll numbers for 2014. 365 people were making over $60,000, which includes stipends, longevity, and coaching. The total stipends for these 365 employees was a half a million dollars. Some of these stipends were for top administration, administrators making over 100K. That totaled $18,000. Net school spending. I find this to be an interesting number because if it doesn't include all capital improvements, you can sit here and say the city doesn't spend that school spending, but it does spend millions in renovations in the schools for the kids. It can't be left up to the taxpayer. Um, remember, taxpayers have families too and, and need support, and we keep being squeezed by all departments. Thank you. Teachers to go do the job and go teach us. 
I'm not saying that school money should flow endlessly, but we have to drop teachers to save a bucket too. We actually do need our teachers more than we need any staff. It does seem that schools are always in need of some more money. And from the three school committees I've been to recently, I know why. It's because some of the people standing in front of me are too scared to make a change. Ooh. And I... <laughs>
However, the past few years have left me disillusioned regarding the educational atmosphere in the city. You have asked the community for suggestions as to how this budget crisis can be fixed. I don't know. And I don't think it's my responsibility. Woo! I think a balanced budget is the responsibility of city management, the school department, and the school committee. And they should be able to create a strong working relationship and process where there's openness and transparency all the way through. understand and make others in the community, with and without a direct stake in the game, aware that the public schools need to be a priority. We have been asked not to point fingers, only to provide constructive criticism. All the while, we are forced to watch three divided yet inextricably connected departments point the finger at each other. So I apologize for being light on suggestions, but I can only work in realities, and the realities I've been faced with recently include already overcome crowded classrooms, inadequate staffing, inadequate materials, guilt over a salary that I received advanced degrees for and earned. children 
that if the school size, uh, the classrooms in the school starts to increase and we're starting to decrease positions <coughs> like the dean, who take care of a lot of behaviors every single day, your children are all going to suffer. A teacher cannot take care of 30 behavioral students with language issues, with behavior issues, with academic issues. It may start at home, but it doesn't always happen that way. We absolutely have to look at the way that we can educate people and find a way to make sure that our kids don't suffer and they're not held at a disadvantage going forward. So I guess at the end of the day, if we're gonna look into doing cuts, I think they should be done across the board. I think that the mayor, in addition to everybody else, should have to take a cut so that it's equitable. <laughs> If school is a business and education is its product, imagine if you were the consumer. Consumers have the buying power to affect markets and companies listen to their needs or they watch their profits plummet. I have a five-year-old daughter in public kindergarten and her needs, I would argue, aren't much different from my students in middle school. She craves an environment in which she can thrive, where her curiosity is met by adults who listen to her and know how to present tools and information that will challenge her and where her burgeoning sense of identity may blossom into maturity. In our middle schools, world language falls outside of the standard curriculum of core classes of science, language arts, history, and math. The school recognizes their importance with a battery of standardized tests. Apart from the teachers who must weigh students' needs against the mandates of testing and sacrifice meaningful exploration driven by the students' <coughs> curiosity and interest, World language plays a pivotal role in addressing what our students desire from their educational experiences. The work I do with young folks rests in how I empower their voices to engage in an uncertain world. As a world language teacher, I get to allow their needs and wants to drive my curriculum. In world language, students encounter their own unique expressions and, and this is essential to the globalized world in which we live, we navigate relationships and understanding that will permit them to wrestle with what it means to be human and interact with both likeness and difference, familiar and foreign. With all the choices we must make as we navigate the deficits in our budget, let our decisions not render our clients, the young consumers of this education, bankrupt in their future by failing to empower their voices with what is at the heart of world language the interdisciplinary and whole-bodied experience of knowledge. Your address? I'm sorry? A Townsend, Minnesota. Thank you. Larry Janakis, Jr. and then Peter Hakes. Hages? Is it Hages? Hages? Larry first, then Mr. Peter. Hi, um, for the record, my name is Larry Janakis, 148 Grant Street. And um, myself and um, I've worked for the Limits of Public Schools in the Technology Department for 17 years. Myself and five other members of my department um, representing 100 years of service to the Limits of Public Schools is part of this, this cut. Under the current proposal, there is an elimination of the director of technology, two of the three technicians and three at the district level, and three of the six technicians at the building level. However, we are going to keep the 0.5 secretary, which we pay for, but don't actually you have in our office. Um, and the proposal is to replace that with $150,000 um, in outsourcing. I don't know how you're going to replace that many people um, with a $150,000 contract and, and still get service to the students. Um, currently, if we hire an engineer to come in to do some work on our network, we pay anywhere from $150 to $200 an hour. So you do the math. That doesn't give you much time to actually have feet on the ground in the schools. Um, 
we were not given any information about these cuts. Nobody sat down with the technology department and said, hey, how can we reduce costs? How can you be more effective? Um, we basically sat down and we were that our job was going to be eliminated. Um, and, and that was it. Um, but I would like to ask the school committee why no one asked why we paid K-12 Insights $50,000 for a survey tool when Google Apps for Education is free. As the Google <laughs> $10,000 in Spain for our email when Google can do it for free. <laughs> if you did that, you would save my salary or someone else in my department. Um, and consider the insurance. I have, in my department, there were three cuts. Myself, who's, my wife will get insurance, uh, a technician who doesn't collect city insurance, and a, another person who is retiring. So there is no net gain in insurance from cutting those three people in my department. So look at those numbers closely, because they're not accurate.
Prepare computer hardware, install specialized computer software, provide web support, phone, first-in-person technical support. Troubleshoot, maintain, and monitor technical, technical inventory in each classroom, as well as building what? Install, repair, new hardware, sorry. For end users, set up and ensure smooth operation of all computer-based testing. All this, among other duties, constitute my average day. The careful attention to duties by technology support staff provide a smooth working environment for all staff, quality and cost controls for inventory to save precious district funds and ensure that students can learn up to their potential. Removing such valuable human assets threatens the values that Lemister Public Schools hold dear. You limit student ability to establish meaningful relationships with people who provide the technological experience which is integral to future success. The secretaries are public face of Lemister Public Schools. They are whom the public speaks to first when they call or enter the building. They have direct hand in all aspects of running the buildings. Just ask Bobby Raddick. <laughs> the, work the work the secretaries do cannot be replaced. For example, the special education secretaries facilitate the individual education plans for all students of Lemister. These are legal documents with legal requirements. There are 5,759 students in LPS. 1,200 of them have IEPs. That's 20% of the student population is legally obligated. She has 10 minutes. The drastic measures that are being proposed are illustrative of the need for greater cooperation and dialogue between the school department and the city of Lemister and its citizens. Let us begin with a fair and honest evaluation of the city's expenditures, its contributions, and budgeting. Let us focus on eliminating waste and unnecessary costs, not reducing valuable services. I do not claim to know the answers to the issues at hand. However, what I do know is that hamstringing the schools by drastic staff cuts is not the solution. Thank you for your time, and I would thank you for it.
and there is no way that we can provide that given the budget that is currently set forth. Um, children of Lundster deserve a public education period, regardless of what the city will get back, but there is a return on investment for even the childless in this city when you invest in the education. The children that are in the schools right now are going to be our business owners, our doctors, our lawyers, and our leaders yes! very soon. I don't think there's anything to be proud of in keeping taxes low if that is at the expense of our children and our future. <laughs> this means so much to me, and I'm so proud that I got to choose it. Please protect it when you make your decisions. Yes! And then Sean Green is next. Highland Ave and Lemister. Thank you. Um, I'm a parent of three and a citizen, a taxpayer. Um, I was a veteran, so the Air Force taught me that I should have three main points. So here they are. First, first uh, it appears to me that the uh, process to fund our schools in Lemister is broken. Uh, starting every year with an arbitrary net school spending budget and then having to propose a bunch of staff cuts doesn't seem like a sustainable approach. We know health care, transportation, and other costs are always going to continue to rise. We need to have a better process. Um, this doesn't support our teachers in the way that we try to as parents. Um, it's going to reduce quality and it's going to reduce the opportunities that I can see for my kids here in Levenster. Uh, the second point I have is that uh, if you want people's input on ways to save money, you need to show the whole picture. You can't just have a three-page list of cuts. So, I encourage the school committee um, and the city to produce a real budget um, and then propose ways so we can save money and you're probably going to get better inputs if you show people the entire picture. Um, I would also point out that um, on a number of the points in the proposed uh, reductions to meet that, that school spending budget, um, I question whether the um, savings from outsourcing are really going to be realized. For example, do you have proposals from corporations to outsource services? If it's just based on estimates, and even if it's based on proposals, some of your savings margins um, are pretty thin. Uh, and then my last point is, I would just like to offer, I would like to suggest that it's hard for me to believe that in our city's budget, there's not three to five million dollars that's going to some other higher priority than our education. Next is Sean Green and in Charlotte. Watkins. Go ahead, Sean. Sean Green, 23 Benjamin Street, uh, father of three. That's a lot of people. Uh, <laughs> I do want to thank the school committee and the elected officials. Um, they are ordinary people. They are giving up a lot of extra time that people don't know about and they get paid next to nothing. So I do want to appreciate that for a moment. <laughs> Except for one person, 
And for that, I'd like to put in a vote for no confidence in our superintendent. their unique style of learning. Who do we not serve? 
We must provide not only for their academic education, but for their safety, nutrition, emotional, mental, physical, environmental, and transient minds, souls, and spirits. From those who have been born and raised in this community to those who have recently moved here from places literally all over the world, how much money does it take? When is it enough? Who do we not serve? Even the most affluent of families in our district can't escape the adversity and challenges of their children's developing fragile lives. Those attributes are shared by every single family, yet we in the Limester Public Schools and Community Departments must provide or we will be held accountable for not doing our jobs. Can we put a price on this? We as the employees of the Lemister Public Schools, in whatever capacity we serve in this district, have one chance each year to foster our students, and then our chance is gone. We don't have the luxury to say to them, wait till next year. Without a doubt, Lemister's community that prides itself on protecting, serving, and educating every citizen within its borders. And I am quite certain that the citizen of the city of Lemister and the state of Massachusetts is far from broke. It is the funding that is broken, and I suggest we all listen to Representative uh, Natalie Higgins and do what she has asked us to do. <laughs> a much sale goes on the market in this city, and in days is sold. Good for Lemonster. Businesses appear before our very eyes and the community blossoms. Again, how much is enough? How can we feasibly sustain a comfortable lifestyle in this community? The reason people are re relocating here is to be protected, served, and provided a first-class education. Now look at the faces of those who serve this city, who believe that working in Lumster would certainly create a future for them, their families, and their properties. Schools that are well-funded so the children can thrive and flourish, each at their own pace. My concern is for the newest employees, whose lives may be decimated by one simple letter, who will be told, we can no longer afford to fund your position. A position, by the way, that the schools couldn't function without for many years. My concern is for those who have served their entire professional lives and now deserve the dignity of a retirement that enhances their trusted and devoted years of service. I'm almost done. My concern is for the children who have found a safe place to nurture their unique talents and abilities, their gifts, if you will. How does this committee decide which gift is essential to a child's life and which can they do without? As a person who has been blessed for many years to work with these children, I could never, as their teacher, model, or guide, deny them anything that might jeopardize their love of life. Something that fills their souls, something that strengthens their bodies, that increases their awareness of our diverse lifestyles, something that fulfills them to be a complete, productive, thinking, loving, compassionate human being. What do we deny them? How do you decide? And how do you put opportunities into categories? Crucial, essential, and, oh well, something and someone has to go. We are here to innovate, educate, and create the future. Please find a way to move Lemister forward in this time and into the future, and do, do not take us back into Proposition Two and a Half Days, where we are left to start from the bottom and build up again. Our community is on the rise. Our children have healthy choices in their lives, opportunities to feel supported and cared for, so they can see ahead from this day, not backwards. This is what the employees of Lemister Public Schools have committed their lives to, remaining tenacious, focused and dedicated to our profession, the people who support our profession and the people who support our work in the classrooms, on the fields, in the music, art rooms, drama rooms, stage, and any creator endeavor, like the over 80 extracurricular activities available to our children in our schools. Please, come and visit. Thank you for your time.
May 22nd. I want to talk to you a little bit about privatization and what happens. <coughs> Private companies are for profit. They are not for district. As a young lady that was, as was a student here pointed out in reference to the cafeteria workers, um, you may be making the assumption, oh, these great, great people that have been working for us all of this time, these great, reliable people that do such a great job in the schools, the, the company will hire them. Sure. <laughs> not at a living wage. Not for the benefit. We talked to you a little bit about what these companies do. What they wind up with is a contract so that we just so hot. These custodians, as most of you know, do what it takes to get these buildings clean. talk to them about the experience of Chelmsford, Massachusetts. I would urge any of you to Google, which is free. You get five minutes for seconds for that. Chelmsford, Massachusetts privatization. And I'm going to be passing out to the committee and the superintendent some links that I will email you to so that you can just click it. Okay. <laughs> Questions rise on outsourced janitorial work. Chelmsford leaders rethink move after school cost increases. Thefts. Chelmsford school custodian charged with stealing computers. <coughs> Worker arrests raise alarm on Chelmsford school contractor. Was there a mark? Ex custodian pleads not guilty. Custodian sought in Chelmsford high theft. Police, custodian caught stealing Chelmsford students, plural, apostrophe, drugs. <laughs> that is the largest office. School's custodian provider feels criticism. Chelmsford Union, contractor not screening custodians properly. <coughs> okay, thank you. Um, so I will be leaving copies of this. I will email you so that you have links. Uh, and at the end of the day, Shellsburg rehired their custodians back. Uh, the issues that they're trying to fix. Uh, 
And I'd like to just say that uh, I have some concerns, especially with the outsourcing of the, I, uh, of the IT and the janitorial department. Uh, outsourcing the janitorial IT department uh, is going to uh, create, uh, is going to be paying money, not to the citizens of Lemonster, who will in turn, because of the flow of money, will eventually return to the school at some point, uh, as opposed it will be going to another uh, another area where the outsourcer is. Um, and I'm also concerned about the, the removal of many of the staff, especially the teachers, uh, as it will uh, not only uh, increase unemployment, uh, but it will also cause a lot of jobs to move out of Lemonster, uh, because if these teachers wish to continue their uh, occupations as a teacher, they will not be able to do it in Lemonster, uh, so they will have to move elsewhere, ergo taking jobs that could be in Lemonster, out of Lemonster. Because our programs in our school are Chapter 74 Vocational Technical Certified Programs, every student that's in our school is reimbursed. You've heard about the foundation budget tonight. Every student in our school, we get a reimbursement of $4,500 more than regular students in school, regular straight academic students. So this uh, past few years, we've, had, we've averaged around 667 students in our school. And this results in an extra $3 million coming to the city of Lemonster because of the students in vocational technical education. And that $3 million, you might think, goes to us, but it doesn't. It goes to a general fund for all of the schools to use. And even though we don't get a cut of that, we enjoy doing that because that's our way of servicing the students and the people in our community. <laughs> We heard earlier tonight about West Boylston sending students to our school. Um, we are hoping that in the near future we could have as many as, it might take four years, but we could have as many as 40 students coming to our school from West Boylston. And per chance if that should happen, that would equal about $425,000 more coming into our district. I have so much more I can tell you, but we only have two minutes. <laughs> so I'm going to turn the microphone over to uh, Dan Bashan, our assistant. <laughs> Good evening. Again, my name is Dan Bashan, and I'm the assistant principal of the Lemister Center for Technical Education. <laughs> This vocational school in Lemister has been around since the 1950s. We have 12 vocational programs. We also have three programs that have three instructors. They are carpentry, plumbing, and electrical. These programs help us do outside work and run an outside program to give these kids valuable hands-on skills in a real-world setting. Unfortunately, with these budget cuts, if we lose, we would probably lose these three instructors, and if we lost these instructors, it would be detrimental to the Center for Technical Education. We have performed work with these teachers. They have worked with their students on several city projects, and they saved the city on all the labor costs on these projects that they worked on, such as the Lemister Veterans Center, 
the Allen Press Community Center, the Leominster Office of Emergency Management, the Gallagher Building renovations, the Police Station 911 Call Center renovation, the Leominster Courthouse renovations. We just did that this year. Uh, what a great job they did. If you get, well, if you ever go to jail downstairs, you'll see it. <laughs> you don't want to be there. <laughs> we also built four kiosks for the Parks and Recreation Department, as you can see throughout the city. Each year we winterize the state pool and the Doyle Field bathhouses. And we also take care of the concessions there. And we reopen them in the spring, making sure there's no leaks and everything works. We've even painted the state pool free of charge. We work closely with the DPW to repair city park structures as needed and have performed a lot of work at Shoulder Farms to help keep their office operation running. All of this is done by the kids free of charge. This year, our outside instructors and their students are responsible for saving the city over $170,000 in labor charges. That's just this year. <laughs> Several of the programs at CTE, I also contribute savings to the city and the district, such as the Graphic Arts Program, with signage, printing, and copying needs, auto technology with repairs and maintenance to the fleet of vans used by the school in the city, auto collision repair with the restoration of an auxiliary maintenance, excuse me, an auxiliary uh, vehicle for the Veterans Center, and our culinary arts program with its participation in events like Taste of Lemister, Johnny Appleseed Festival, and LEF events. The list goes on. I'm asking the school committee, please do not cut these three CTEI positions. It will be detrimental to these three instructor shops, and it will eliminate our ability to provide these services that I just listed. Thank you. And then Denise Levin is after that. My name's Chris Rue, 83 Keeneland Circle. The proud son of two career long educators. Proud father of two twin girls who are in the first grade currently at Fallbrook Elementary School. My wife and I moved our little family out here three years ago specifically because the good things we heard about Paul Park. So this is a hell of a thing. I didn't see walking into this two years into our child's education, our children's education. It's been said that society is judged by how it treats the least among us. Children cannot vote. They are at the mercy of adults. Personally, I feel if we had things growing up, it's our duty to pay it forward, and we're not holding up our end of the deal if we don't. I'm sympathetic to the budget challenges, but we are not in a recession. This is not a time of pessimism and fear. This is a time for courage and optimism. <laughs> Roughly half of the people in the room probably supported the last president and believed he got us out of the recession. Roughly, the other half of the people in the room believe this guy is going to make us all rich. Either way, it's a time for optimism. We should all be in agreement. <coughs> I just ask that the city find a way, be adults, hold up your end of the deal, and keep our kids' schools whole. And good job to, was it Sarah, and all the kids who spoke up. I 
have four children under the age of 10, and I'm a public school teacher, not in Munster. So I came here knowing what I wanted to say tonight, and it's kind of changed as I've been really listening in the audience and thinking about some of the things I've seen on social media. I would start by saying that as a mother of four and a public school teacher, I know about budgeting, I know about uh, being careful with your resources, and I know about saving for a rainy day. And when I do those things in my home, I don't do it by not changing the batteries in the smoke detector or not getting my furnace checked or not taking care of the basic maintenance. Our public schools are basic maintenance for our democracy. If you don't recognize that, then I would point out to you that we are currently living in a time of fake news and alternative facts, and there is no place that's going to protect us from that better than our public schools. And just like when I hire somebody, when I hire somebody to come into my home and maintain my systems and keep my family safe, I don't hire some cut-rate person off of the internet. I am irritated beyond belief about what I've heard about salaries and unions and medical care. Our teachers tonight have done a great job of speaking for the schools and for the students, so I just want to take a minute and speak for them and say that we have highly trained professionals. They get advanced degrees that they'll be paying for probably for the next 20 years. They do continuing education constantly. They get constant mandates thrown at them to take this class or keep up these PDP points. They spend their summers and their nights and their weekends making sure that when they get into the classroom, no matter what we throw at them, what we expect, they are going to meet those needs while wiping tears and holding hands and teaching our kids to be basic, decent citizens. Jasmine is next, after Denise. Go ahead, Denise. Good evening, my name is Denise Lebeck. I live at 32 Apple Tree Lane. I am the parent of one child in the school system and of two recent Lemonster High School graduates. It feels as if, as if every year I come to these meetings about this, at about this time to speak on behalf of the many amazing teachers and, the, and students um, in this district. And I would just like to say before I continue, the goals that were presented tonight for the school district, there is no way you will be meeting any of those goals based on this budget. One of the greatest assets in the community is the quality of its school. There is a direct correlation between the quality of schools and our property values. If the schools continue to be funded at the absolute minimum, minimum, it will begin to affect our property values, which are finally starting to come back after the housing crisis. More importantly than that, however, is how devastating these cuts are going to be to students. When I saw the list of cuts, I was astounded. Just a few weeks ago, I read in the paper that the special education department was out of compliance. Yet there's a plan to cut 36 teachers and paraprofessionals who provide direct service to their students. The proposal to cut dues at the high school is also another huge concern. There are almost 2,000 students at Lemonster High School, and with that comes all kinds of problems. It gives me pause as I'm getting ready to send my youngest child to the high school in the fall. My oldest two recent graduates of Lemonster High School had every opportunity available to them. Every single student in Lemonster should have the same opportunities. In addition to the fact that city administrators choose to only fund the schools at the minimum amount, no matter how it's spun, I also have to question the superintendent's ability to fiscally manage our schools. whether they are providing enough rigorous oversight as to how the money is spent. No we have faced a budget shortfall every year. How is it that the Lemonster Center for Excellence rents space and provides staff at a great cost when it services so few children? These budgets aren't going, these budget concerns are not going away anytime soon. As someone else mentioned, there is a 13% cut in the proposed federal education budget, which is going to add another devastating blow to our schools. 
It is time for the city administrators, the superintendent, the school committee to work together and resolve these budget issues that come up every year and just grow bigger and bigger. No one wants their taxes to go up, myself included. But if Lemonster is to remain a place where families want to live, it is imperative that we have an excellent school system or we will see our property values go down. Our city leaders need to show in no uncertain terms that our children matter. It is your duty as stewards of our tax dollars and your moral imperative to the children of Lemonster that you find a solution. I'm a mom of two children, one in Jed Ed, one in special ed. Both of my boys are fifth generation in Lemonster. Fifth generation. I'm concerned. I'm concerned for my son in general ed. I'm concerned for my son in special ed. I'm concerned for both of them and that their teachers, if their classroom sizes increase, it isn't the best way to teach kids and it will hurt them and their teachers. An overcrowded class makes it hard for the teachers to meet the needs of the students who are often at different levels, especially in special ed. Enough instruction and others will be left with nothing to do as they finish work before their peers and then invite to trouble be caused by boredom. I'm concerned for my special needs child because loss of service for him and will damage his progress irrevocably. The paras and the teachers that have worked with my son, I thank you endlessly. If it was not for you, he would not be where he is today. and because of these paraprofessionals who've gone above and beyond, my son is making friends with atypical students in an atypical classroom outside of the self-contained classroom. And if these services are not met, somewhere I'm afraid that I'm going to have to out put him out to another school that will give him the resources that he deserves. And he's not going to be able to continue his education with the same peers that he has bonded with and made relationships with and that will stand beside him from 4th grade to 12th grade and beyond. Hello, my name is Jesse Blackman and I live on Pleasant Street. I'm a junior at LHS and I'm in three AP classes, scheduled to take five next year. A varsity, on a varsity sports team, I'm involved in five clubs, and I'm deeply involved in the Lemonster Music Program. As one of the many students who are also deeply involved with these programs that Lemonster has to offer, I'm here tonight to express my concerns and irritability over the possibility that we could lose everything that every student, every teacher, every staff member, every parent deserves. So please tell me, how could you say that you prioritize education when you do this to such a hard-working, deserving community? In addition, how could you say that you care not just about Lemonster's future, but you care when you vastly cut components of our educational experiences? This is a foolish wasting of our precious funded, intended for education. In many aspects, such as overpaying undeserving officials. Lemonster, we deserve so much more than you're proposing to us tonight. Public schools because I've had to advocate for putting LEAP back at times when it was going to be taken away. And I've been to many, many, many school committee meetings to try to um, support special education. Uh, so I guess I'm going to talk a little bit about that tonight. So I've been here for about 10 years. We're homeowners, so I'm not from here. I grew up on the South Shore. But when you go to look for a home, what do you look for? You look for a safe community. You look for a good community, and what's the third thing you look for? Good, good, good schools. 
I'm very, very concerned as a homeowner, even if I wasn't a parent, because to me, it's already been said, education is the cornerstone of democracy. And it's going to be absolutely attached to our um, real estate values. Uh, again, I've advocated very hard. My kids are 11 and 13, and, I'm, and I will continue to advocate. I'm so glad it fills my heart to see so many people here tonight, because when you're a special education parent, you go to a lot of school committee meetings, and there's about three other people in the room. So I've been doing this for a long time. So it does fill my heart that everybody's here tonight wanting something better for their kids. And as Natalie Higgins said, you know, we've got to change the uh, formula. It's outdated. I actually just graduated from Southern University with my MBA. We talked about this. It's an old formula, but that's not going to solve the immediate issues, and we've got to deal with this. Um, if we cannot fix this, as Jasmine has already said, I worked too hard to bring my boys too far, and I don't want to cry. I'm going to have to send them somewhere else. I don't know whether I don't know whether you know where we'll scrape up the funding for private school, but I don't want to do that because I live here and I want to see things get better. But what I want to say tonight in my last five seconds is, I beg you as somebody who's been to too many school committee meetings with three people, please don't just come tonight and walk out that door. Please stay involved, email your school committee, support your teachers, and be in it for the long haul. Don't just show up once and walk away, please. I live at 178 Fifth Street in Leominster, and I am a mother of four amazing children here. Um, I want to say first, I, what a wonderful job I think all the students who spoke did, and, and their evidence of the work that the teachers in our district have done. And as we look at plans for the future, please do not make any more changes to Southeast which is Francis Drake, which will be a preschool that was a middle school, that was a K-8. to Stop changing the districts and the boundary lines, please, on my children. I encourage the school committee tonight to fund the education community that is needed. Our local government is established with a system of checks and balances. The school committee and the mayor are supposed to work together to create a budget based on community and education needs and wants. That budget is then voted upon by the school committee and is supposed to be given to the city council. The city council, in a system of checks and balances, can only cut the budget as they feel needed. What is happening is a minimum net school spending budget is being given to the city council so they can't make any changes. They can't cut from the minimum. They can't add because they don't have that authority. There is no system of checks and balances. There is only a, this is what your kids are going to get system. We are not drive-through adding for things to be added to the package. I ask for the school committee to dream big about what our kids need and deserve. And if they can't do that, at least be realistic and dream about compliance. <laughs> Elizabeth Duffy. My name is Laura Sabana. I live on 72 Keeneland Circle. I'm a sophomore here at Lemonster High School. And these budget cuts that you guys want to do are ridiculous. Um, creating these budget cuts will impact everybody here today, whether you're a teacher, a staff member, a Lemonster resident, or most importantly, a student. Today, we need to talk about what's really mostly important for all of us. Um, you want to get rid of more teachers. But we can't do that. You guys do not walk these calls every day. You guys do not spend six hours a day in the school. So unfortunately, you guys will not see the impact that it has on us. We're just going to As of right now, we barely have teachers to teach our core classes. They are overfilled and they are oversized. We barely have any teachers to teach our substitute classes. We're often put in the gym, the cafeteria, or in the auditorium because nobody is there to walk over. <laughs> and yet you guys want to get rid of more teachers. Um, 
You want to reduce the number of teachers that's creating the possibility of eliminating AP classes, sports, and extracurricular activities, stripping away that so many students look forward to all day or all year. You would be tearing opportunities away from kids getting scholarships because of the sports they play or the activities they partake in. You are ultimately ruining a chance, or should I say a dream, for a student. It is not fair. Us students did nothing to deserve this budget crisis, and we do not deserve to have our chances of a greater future be limited. And we do not deserve to be not a competitive district to get into the colleges that we want to get into. When you do these budget cuts, think about who this will be directly affecting. It is not you guys, but it is all of us. It is all the students in Lemonster High School. We are the future. These kids in Lemonster, we are all the we are all the future, and we are all going to be participating later on. So I ask all of you, the committee, the mayor, the superintendent, to really think about the consequences that is going to happen to us. So thank you, and have a great day. And then Christina Chatelain. I can't remember her last name. I'm sorry, but she's got a really good image of. Hi, my name is Elizabeth Duffy at 276 Leggett Home Road, and I'm a sophomore here at Lemonster High School. The next two years will be the most important of my high school career. These next two years will impact my future as I will start applying for colleges. Advocated throughout Lemonster High School is the letters HEART. This stands for Honesty, Excellence, Achievement, Responsibility, and Teamwork. How do you expect my peers and I to excel if these budget cuts are put in place? With these budget cuts, I may not be able to take the classes needed, nor the resources to do so. Lemonster Center for Excellence have many resources and funding to help the only 35 kids who attend. Yet, when it comes down to 2,000 students who need funding, where is the help that we need? When I need help in choosing my colleges and what I want to do in life, where will I go if these budget cuts are made? All three of the deans will be gone, and the ones who are supposed to be here to guide us through high school and proposing to get rid of JV sports, this not only reduces physical activity, but not every kid is academically excelled in sports is giving the encouragement to do their best in school or else they will be taken off the team. How are you going to make these cuts when you have not stepped in our schools? How are you going to put all these students' futures on the line? Why do us students and staff have to struggle all because the town mismanaged our money? Thank you. My name is Christina Chitalian. I live in Lemons, German, Newport. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Mayor and the school committee. I'm a parent of an elementary school student in Lemonster with a learning difference. One out of five children in Massachusetts have dyslexia. These are children that need special education services that are at great risk. These cuts will have a great detriment to our population. The most vulnerable population are children. The cuts today in schools can have lifelong consequences. Children that may not be able to read. Children that may not be able to be our future leaders our future business owners in the city. <laughs> the schools and our teachers are already spread thin. Additional cuts will be costly in the long run. If they can't get the services in schools such as special education, it will have to be outsourced. Someone had mentioned initially that the state is not in regulation in some of these areas. This will be of a greater detriment and will continue to be not in regulation. I say today to the school committee and the mayor to think of the children in the community and our future generation here in Lemonster. How did we get here? Will we be in the same position next year? Our kids deserve better. We deserve better. Thank you.
class of 2017 and Woo! class of 2021 at Salem State University. Woo! All because of these teachers. <laughs> With this proposed budget, we would cut multiple teachers, multiple administrators, junior varsity sports. 50% of the arts and all after school activities budget will be cut. And uh, that gives kids less time to spend their time with teachers, less time away from homes that might be destructive, and less time working on skills they enjoy to work on. If you want student choice to remain so strong, and for Lemster High School to remain such an attractive school to attend, then this budget must be fixed. I myself have been in the art of theater, and I am now doing that as a career, thanks to Lemster High School. Why are we adding programs in all the different schools when we need work in what we have? If you want another Little Mermaid or another Hello Dolly to be performed on this stage, then this baseline can't stay. If you have this budget take away 50% of the original budget, then where will kids go when they need to express themselves, say on the stage, say you know in the art rooms? If it weren't for Andrea Mastroni in that crowd right there, for Tim Smith, Tony, Miss Daisy, Miss Condicio, everyone in the E Wing, I would not be standing here before you today. I joined theater because I didn't know where else to go. And now I'm doing it as a BFA at Salem State University 2021. And if you take away 50% of the budget, you're going to take away chances for kids like me who can't go home. They just can't. So you're going to take away chances for them and to be like me, to go to, to go to college for what they love, and if they can't find what they love, that's on your hands. Thank you. Applicant, applicant 
for any college. However, if they weren't capable of participating in, in extracurriculars, their chances of an, um, admission in, their, in the institution diminished. Furthermore, the bill would compromise our academics. Our classes are already ready with about 26 students in some of our classes. Your bill will only increase this. This makes it extremely difficult for teachers to be able to indiv individually work with students while simultaneously completing their curriculum. Many students are aware of the career path they want to take by sophomore year and they choose their complementary classes. However, with classes and teachers being cut, we wouldn't be able to do so. For the classes we do have, we barely have the necessary materials for success. Ooh. To conclude, my parents came to this country from a rural region in India where they had to endure a lot of stress and difficulty. They came to this country with the hope that their children will have a better academic future and an overall quality of life. I'm beginning to think their wish shall remain unfulfilled, but I hope you can prove me otherwise. over the minimum legal funding. Last year, it was 0.1% over the minimum. 70% of Massachusetts school districts invest more per student than Lemster Public Schools. And 91% of all Massachusetts schools pay more than Lemster teachers. So I don't understand why we've had this big debacle over how much teachers should be paid. Also, if you're willing to bump deans down, then the school would just run wild all over itself. I had a teacher tell me that he's going to equip himself with two baseball bats because he fears for his own safety that someone's going to do something stupid because there will be limited to none discipline at all. And also, for, for your objective, in all my high school years, I've been told to get involved into extracurricular activities, become more invested, into everything so I can prepare myself to become a college student. By cutting down 50% of all extracurricular activities, I see that objective to be completely destroyed. I'm staring down a bunch of hypocrites. Thank you. demonstration of interest in your education is why I'm here. Great community, I'm delighted to be your principal. First thing I want to do is I want to recognize an extraordinary team because it's impossible to run a building of this complexity and this size without a great team of instructional leaders and administrators. They've done something very special for the students here that has never happened in Lemister over the last couple months, even before we knew there was going to be budget problems. They've completed the master schedule for next year for all the students in the school, so they know what they're taking in September, we can hand those schedules out tomorrow if we wanted to. That's a primary driver for how the high school manages its money and its time and its people. Several things were put into our master schedule that you should be aware of by this team. We have an academic learning center, an English language learner team, ninth and 10th grade resource teachers, and all 16 teachers on the 19th, on the ninth grade teams have all been established within our current master schedule to support our most needy students, which is what our MCAS scores are trying to do to increase. If we go through with this budget cuts, we can't cut the special needs programs. They're already at capacity, and the class sizes there can't be raised any higher. The class sizes that are going to be impacted are the classes in English, Math, Science, Social Studies, and World Language. We'll be taking two teachers out of each of the core subjects and one out of World Language, and that will take about 80 sections in the Science and Social Studies, for example, and driving it down to 70. So imagine 250 students that are currently out in those 10 sections of classes being brought into those 70 remaining classes. Class sizes are going to go up to between 28 and 30. Two, we sat down with a team a couple of days ago and determined that between two and eight of the 16 advanced programs would be uh, reduced. 
And we're also going to have some problems in the chemistry labs with 25 to 30 kids. Uh, that will be resulting in some safety concerns. The deans, not having a deans in our school, will have some big problems with the relationships with our kids. The number of disciplinary issues with following assistant principals, and they're already observing two times more teachers than all the other administrators in the Midwatch area. Um, two other cuts that we'll need to make is a guidance counselor that will put our total of guidance counselors to 320, 340 students per guidance counselor, which will put us on probation for another reason for the NAASC. Our personalization in our homerooms will go from 15 to 1 to 18 to 1. There's currently 194 students that are taking the PE waiver, and if there's no junior varsity sports, about half of them will have to come back into the master schedule so they can meet the graduation requirement. And you already know roughly half of our clubs will be done. I might have to come back to the school committee after we take a close look at what the bottom line budget cut is and make recommendations for the changing of the graduation requirements in order to be able to get the kids to graduate here by the end. These are some pretty tough times, and we need to work together to try and solve it. And the most important thing, and I'll leave you with here, there's some extraordinary relationships that have been developed with your students, within one another, within your teachers here. And a lot of that, and that's the most important part, that's going to get railroaded by having these budget cuts go through. Thank you for your time. Thank you. We are going to take a two-minute... Jeffrey, is it okay if we take a two-minute recess? Do you mind? I'll give you an extra 30 seconds. No. Just a two-minute break, and we'll be right back. Once again, okay. Jeffrey, go ahead. Welcome back, everybody. Welcome back to a question break. My name is Jeffrey Vicarina. Excuse me, can I get your attention, please? Thank you. I'm a lifelong resident of Lomaster, and I currently work in the Lomaster High School as a substitute teacher. Yeah. And uh, let's get down to brass tacks, people. This budget proposal that we have gathered here tonight to discuss is nothing less than an assault upon our education system. <laughs> Also, can you talk about how these cuts that we are here to discuss are so draconian, I can't believe them, but we have the unmitigated gall to write creating the future up here? These cuts are not going to create a future for our students, they're going to destroy it. Let's be honest. In my time here, I've been very proud to work with the teachers and the deans here, and I've personally seen how hard they work every day to create a safe educational environment for the students, and I'm proud of that. And the reason why we're in this financial hole to begin with is because of consistent mismanagement of finances at the very top level for over a decade. And for those people who have mismanaged our finances so poorly to get off spot for you, while our teachers and deans and students bear the burden, is nothing less than a miscarriage of justice. And I firmly believe that. And unfortunately, until we commit to funding the school system more appropriately, this is not going to change, and that's reality. In closing, all I have to say is that I think Lemonsker is a great school system. I think it has a lot of potential, but it's clear to me we have a long way to go. And until we get better funding for our school system, and until we stop consistently cutting, we're not going to get there. Christopher Castro is an actor. Good evening, Carrie Duff, Low Street, the parent of two Lemonster public school children who have attended Francis Drake, Northwest, Samoset, Skyview, and now Lemonster High School. I'm also the principal of the Lemonster Center for Excellence. My, my kids, they're fine. But I'm here to talk to you about the same kids that Bernadette mentioned. All the kids in Lemonster that need our support. Folks want to know, what do we do with the Lemonster Excellence Center for Excellence, and how much does it cost? So I'm going to focus on those two things tonight. First, I'm going to lead you, read you a letter that explains pretty succinctly the work that we do and the level at which we do it for these students who are some of the most vulnerable in our city. And then I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how much it costs to do that. <coughs> Dear Mayor Mazzarella and the Lemonster School Committee, this letter is from Chad Detrimont, the um, 
director, the executive director of the Ready Center for Education and Research and Policy. This letter expresses the Ready Center for Education, Research and Policy's full support for the Lemster Center for Excellence. The Ready Center is an independent, nonpartisan research center that aims to improve public education through well-informed decision making based on deep knowledge and as evidence of effective policy making and practice. Through this work, we have both studied LCE and its pioneering student-centered approach to learning, as well as partnered to build the school's capacity to collect high-quality data. The continuation of LCE would benefit currently enrolled students accessing critical post-secondary supports. LCE serves as a model for the local community and the state, demonstrating innovative approaches to providing all students with pathways to work and life success. In the Rennie Center's 2017 report on the condition of education in Massachusetts, LCE was featured... I'm going to take a little more time since Larissa took some more time last night. Uh, was featured as an exemplar institution. LCE helps students get ready for the demands of today's labor market through coursework aligned with their interests and academic needs, mentoring with supportive staff, and work-based learning experience with local employers. Through exhibitions, students demonstrate mastery of skills and develop a portfolio of accomplishments that are transferable to their post-secondary opportunity of choice. To date, few schools in Massachusetts can claim to have had an innovative and effect, such an innovative and effective approach to learning. Findings from our work together will continue to be featured in public events, legislative briefings, national academic journals and media reports, further showcasing the successes and lessons learned at LCE. I'm out of time, so I will just let you know that if you care to trust me, our per pupil spending at Lemster Center for Excellence does not exceed the per pupil spending at the Center for Technical Education and Innovation. And by FY19, we will be equal to the level of the high school as our student population grows. I will post our line item budget with projections for the next five years on our School Blocks website when I leave this meeting. Thank you. Chris Castro, and then Megan LeBlanc. Chris Castro, 3780 Terrence Drive. I'm a legislative intern at Natalie Higgins, our state representative, and a sophomore at Lemison Center for Excellence. <laughs> my mom moved me and my brother from New York City, the Bronx, over here to Lemison, Massachusetts, because of a distant family member that we weren't even connected to. My whole educational career was full of negativity up to this point. In second grade, a teacher looked me in my face in front of the whole class and told me I wouldn't amount to anything. That I would sit on the side of the street with the rest of my family, living in poverty and feeding off of the money that people would drop in a silicone cup. My eight-year-old self didn't understand any of that. But what really hurt me was all the kids laughing all around me, surrounding me, and basically supporting that negativity. That's when my mother knew that she had to take me out of the city and bring me here. When I came to the city and I began to go to these schools, I was still feeling very negative toward education because I wasn't doing what I wanted to do. I was doing what I was obligated to do and what I was forced to learn. The Lemons Center for Excellence gave me an opportunity. First, before I went there, I was always told that it's a negative school and that you don't want to go there because it's the only place where the bad kids go. When I entered the school, the first thing I was told was, what is your dream? I said, what? Why do you care about what I want to do with my life? I'm only here because I'm supposed to just do high school classes and be out. They said, no, your high school classes are about your dreams. So we're going to take your dream and we're going to focus on it. And we're going to make every single thing that you learn normally in high school centered around that dream. Okay. I am working right now in the City Hall of Lemonster with State Representative Natalie Higgins. I never thought that I would be able to do that. I'm more active helping the people in poverty in my community than I've ever been in my life. And on top of that, I am following my dream to become a writer and aspiring poet straight from here. So my thing is, our schools were built to support our students' dreams. And by cutting them, all this budget is going to tear down every single one of those students' dreams. So, before we make that decision in cutting, 
I'm up in my face because I'm a kid with a dream. And just like all these dedicated kids here who came here to support this, they all have dreams. So support their dream and find a better solution. Thank you. teacher because no one else has besides Mr. Bajon. I don't really see why. Um, I went to electrical freshman year because it interested me and I didn't think that I wanted to go into any other career besides that and I'm really glad I had that opportunity to begin with. But um, with extra teachers, like he matters more than you might think. If the group has to split up, it's good to have the other like adult to watch everyone. And I just want to know what would happen if he's gone, because he teaches related, and I talked to everyone in shop about it, and they all had the same question, and I just think that we deserve to know, not from our other teacher who will remain with us, not from Mr. Bayshon or Mr. Mandaka, I think that you guys are responsible to tell us, because you're the ones who are making this decision. And I get that it's an important decision to make, but I don't know how necessary it might be, just because... They each have an important role in what we do. And I also want to talk about the importance of the freshman sports and everything. Um, because when I first started in high school, I did cheer, and that was a nice community type thing, but it wasn't really my thing. And then I found theater, which like, means more to me than anything else. And it's really hard for a freshman to find something like that. So I feel like taking away the sports is just taking away. Thank you is just taking away um, their opportunity to find something that will help them throughout their entire high school career and help them make friends in a new environment where they're not really comfortable and that's basically it. Thank you very much. Freya Patel, who's next? Okay. Jennifer? Jennifer Kuyper? Yes, she is. And then Matthew Alabas. Matthew here? There he is. Come on down. <laughs> Good evening, Jen Piper, uh, 104 Center Road in Pittsburgh. So I stand before you as a parent of a school choice child into this district. He is a senior this year, thank God. I also stand before you as a teacher. Your address, please. 104 Center Road. I also stand before you as a teacher in this district for 17 years, and I stand before you as the Lemster Education Association president. As I said last night, there are names behind all of those numbers. The effects of this proposed budget are farther reaching than anyone can imagine. I could not have captured all of those stories that were told tonight, not in two minutes. I applaud all of you for taking that two minutes and sharing your story. Listen to those stories. Bottom line, who suffers the most? The students. We have created a city school district that is raising up some of the best students, but that will suffer. That cannot happen. My charge to the superintendent, the mayor, the school committee, you need to start working together. If you do not start working <coughs> together and being transparent with each other, the teachers are going to fight. You have heard them all night long. They are ready. They are ready to push back. Start working together. We cannot afford to watch our education for our students dwindle from what it is right now. 
Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Tonight is making me think about it, if I should be looking for a relocation. 
because their future is dependent on this. It's something that I want to give and I don't have that. We, I can't even pass them down more than, I cannot pass them down on my own, but, I'm sorry. You got it. On a good system, on a system that I came in, and a system that I brought them in. I don't want to be responsible to give them something that they cannot work with. And this is something that they cannot work with. This is something that I cannot work with for the future. To become the person that we are today, looking for their kids' future. So please find a solution. And I don't believe it's outsourcing, because that's not working for none of the, none of the companies that are going through that route. The only people that outsourcing works for is for the owners of the companies that make it the profits. We got a compensation system for the metropolitan area. They outsource to a private company and every two years they have to give more money to them because they cannot operate on the budget that they promised to. It might work on the first year on paper. After that, it's horrendous. So please, make it work for our kids. cuts affect me directly as everybody has been saying tonight. Cutting 15 teaching positions will, or I think there's more actually, will directly affect everybody's education. Having less teachers means less available classes and therefore class sizes will increase considerably. I know that in all of my classes we barely have enough desks to see students this year. Next year we would also be reducing funds for school supplies by 20%, therefore we would be able to buy few to zero new desks. On top of that, classrooms can't even fit any more desks as it is, so even if we could buy more. So please tell me, where are we going to put these extra five students in my class, or where are we going to put these extra ten, these extra fifteen people in my class? Like, increases in class sizes also affects many students' ability to learn. Because I know that I do better with, like, more one-on-one -on -one education, and it's going to be very hard to educate people when teachers can't control their classes because they're so big. Um, cutting... Cutting all of these teachers jeopardizes, cutting all these teachers also jeopardizes students' chances of getting into colleges. Less teachers means less opportunities for higher level classes, extracurriculars, and sports. Colleges like to admit well-rounded people, and if we as a whole have less opportunities to, opportunities to succeed, colleges will be that much harder to get into. And cutting JV sports is also a huge problem. This will mean that very few people will be playing sports and our school will be less will be collectively less active, and the gym class will probably increase as well, and the gym class is already huge. I am on the varsity tennis team this year, and this is a, like a direct example of what would happen to all of our, um, what will happen to all of our sports program if JV is cut, because var cause varsity tennis does not have a JV program, and most of the people who try out have almost no, no prior tennis experience. So as a result, like people are admitted to the varsity level without having any prior experience, aren't having any prior experience, and that, and we're facing up against regional schools who are like top in the state. So we have been losing every single match. And I know that I never played sports before I came to high school, and I really want that was something I really wanted to do in high school because I had the opportunity to. And future students won't have that choice because the only ones that will be admitted to varsity teams are will be people who have played all their lives. Um, yeah. <laughs> On top of that, extracurriculars provides a nice outlet for people who have a bad home lives or other out-of-school dilemmas, and sports help keep students out of, out of trouble because when you are on a sports team, you can't get in trouble or you will be kicked off the team, so that motivates people to stay out of trouble. And cutting all the deans on putting their responsibilities on the vice principals is a mistake. The vice principals already have enough on their plate, and disciplining students probably would not be their main priority like it is for the deans. Many of the troublemakers at our school respect our deans and therefore accept the disciplines they give them, whereas they would, not, they would have less respect for a new disciplinary committee. This makes me and a lot of my peers feel unsafe at school because now we will have all these students causing havoc in our school and we, our school thus became chaos. If you're looking for ways to solve the problem, I think instead you could do something not so drastic. A big help would maybe be having the city pay for transportation. This probably is good. <laughs> It's probably going to mean that we would have to raise taxes, 
but and people in town who don't have students who go to school would be upset that they have to pay higher taxes but if Lemister has a lackluster school district nobody knew was going to want to come to town and if nobody knew wants to come to town because of our lackluster school district property values will go down property taxes will go down and people simply won't want to live here just making a few simple fixes like this I think these cuts do not have to be so drastic and our education does not have to suffer Uh, my name is Elijah Collins, and as a student at Lancaster <coughs> High School, I have witnessed the effect of extracurricular activities on each student. For me, becoming class and running team president has provided me with an experience of a lifetime. Extracurricular activities matter, yet we're discussing a bill that would strip that from a student's educational experience. The very programs that fill a student with pride and joy will be removed. The students that devote so much of their time inside and outside of these walls are facing a bill that could jeopardize all the time and effort that they put into earning their degrees, not only for themselves, but for their students. Last year, the students of Lemister High School stood hand in hand with teachers who first faced turmoil with their contracts. So I ask, where were you? You say you work to protect the rights of the very producers of our students' educations, but actions speak louder than words. And if that were the case, the contract crisis wouldn't have occurred. I stayed quiet before, so that you continue to come after my education. My future is based on the backs of what the school offers. Yes, students make up roughly 30% of Lemister's population, but we are 100% of Lemister's future. With that said, I can suggest that a committee designed to provide the best solution for our students should stop sacrificing our education because of the mistakes that you have made. This budget cut is a step backwards. Try focusing on our futures. obviously isn't my area of expertise. <laughs> However, I want to help you understand just how unfair these budget cuts are. I'm the outgoing president of our student council, the outgoing um, secretary of our National Honor Society, the outgoing co-president of Friends of Rachel's, and an outgoing member of Shine, Advocates for the Invisible, and Give. Through these clubs, I've seen just how much not only the teachers and other faculty members at our school, but also the students work to make Women's Star High School a better place. To name just a few examples, this year student council introduced a new um, activity called Positivity Week, in which we tried to make everyone feel welcome at Lemonster High School and create a more positive learning environment. We stayed after school for over three hours one day to put up smiley faces all around the schools so each student had a smiley face with their name on it. Friends of Rachel's extended our anti-bullying program to the middle schools this year. And through each of these activities, we have received tremendous support from the staff at Lemonster High School. Clearly our students and faculty are putting our best foot forward to better our schools. Now I'm asking each of you to self-reflect and think about whether or not each of you have done everything you can to make our schools the best they can be. Also, I'd like to continue to point out that through these clubs, I've developed a very strong bond with not only the teachers, but the deans, secretaries, custodians, cafeteria workers, and principal at our school. Each and every one of them <coughs> has played an influential role in shaping me into who I am today and I know they truly care about my education. Right now, with this proposed budget cut, it sure doesn't feel like you care about my education. Those students that sat before you today are the, not only the future of Lemonster, but the future of our country too, and they deserve more than this. Thank you, Ms. Good evening, everyone. My name is Nick Ballin, uh, 29 Long Hill Drive in Lemonster. Um, I graduated from the high school last year. Um, I was heavily involved in high school. I was class president. I was a National Honor Society. I could go on forever. I was very much ingrained in this high school, and I'm very proud of that. Uh, that is one of the reasons that I'm here tonight. The other reason is because my mother is a teacher here in this district. She has been as long as I've been a student in it. Um, she recently just graduated from UMass Amherst. She was a paraprofessional currently. Her goal was to become a teacher in this district uh, as a kindergarten teacher. Those positions are being eliminated, and it pains me to see my mother's hard work over the past two years go to waste like that. She's looking at other school districts, and let me tell you, if she goes to one of those, you are losing one hell of a teacher. <laughs> that 
that's my story. You've heard plenty of those tonight. You guys understand the repercussions, and I'm, I'm confident in that. Um, again, I understand that you guys have done a lot of work, and I thank you for that, and I applaud you for that, but this can't be our best option. Uh, you guys talk a lot about minimizing the impact uh, that students will notice in their day-to-day -day, uh, activities, and what you guys are describing here with this budget plan um, is no education system. Um, you say that you want to minimize the impact on students, and you're lying to yourself if you believe that this proposal accomplishes that. Uh, I know that the extracurriculars that I took part in in high school are the only reason that I got into the college that I did. The AP classes that I took in high school are the only reason that I got into the college that I did. And they're the only reason that I have the passion and the drive to do what I love to do every day. So thank you to the AP teachers. No, a little more. Sorry. It's, I could go on forever. Um, I love Lemonster. Um, if, unless something serious changes, my future children will not be going to Lemonster Public Schools because honestly, as I said earlier, this is no education system and it pains me to say that because I have such love for Lemonster. Um, but I'm here to talk priorities and I understand that the decisions that you make in this process are unimaginably, unimaginably complex. However, I refuse to believe that education should take a backseat to other recipients of municipal funding. I refuse to believe that there is no better way to solve this issue, and I refuse to believe that our current and future students deserve what you have presented tonight. I respect for all of you, and I applaud your work this far. However, this plan is undeniably unacceptable. Thank you. Thank you. So my name is Isabel Lara. I'm a graduate of Lemonster High. I graduated <coughs> last year. Um, I'm now a sophomore at Worcester State University studying, studying history, political science, and education. Um, and that is all thanks to all of the staff at every level of education in Lemonster Public Schools. Andrea Mastriani, Tim Smith, Murph, everyone. Um, during my time at LHS, I was the president of the theater company. I took two AP classes, which earned me credits at my university, and these budgets are quite frankly ridiculous, and the students and staff deserve so much better. I want to be an educator, but if things continue to look this way, I will not be working for the Lemonster Public School District. If they get better, Dr. Lord, if you're still here, keep me in mind. Um, <laughs> Uh, now, it's not the public's job to come up with solutions, it's yours, and it's yours alone. Um, children are our future, and I have some concerns, uh, according, obviously, about the budget, um, such as the rainy day fund that I've heard so much about. Um, where is that money going? Because it could be going to education. Um, even though it's written in our city's charter, um, that the mayor is the head of the school committee is a great conflict of interest, and I hope that eventually changes. Um, the budget has been a problem for the past six years, and there's only been one person that has seen it all, and based on gross fiscal management in education, his election should not have been a landslide, and not only do I have no confidence in our school committee, I have no confidence in my mayor. Thank you. Okay, we'll close this public hearing. We'll close this public hearing. Anyone want to do our old business? Okay, is a motion to adjourn? Second? On, well, let me just say, what's next? So, we have a meeting coming up, Christy? Um, <coughs> finance is going to meet um, trying for Thursday. Um, we are putting together a list of things that we need to determine what their value is monetarily and where we can trim our budget. Things that weren't listed or discussed up here, which I think is a very, very important part of reducing the deficit. So that's our next priority. And then the next Thursday, we should have a uh, closer to a line item budget from the administration. Wait, you said we're having a meeting Thursday, this Thursday? <laughs> we're trying. Okay. Okay, and then, um, as I said, what will happen is the school um, committee will submit any budget they want to, the, to the, whoever they want, but the, the recommended budget that I'm requesting is simply two columns. One is the required spending, and then the second column is 
if there is other additional funding, and there will be, put towards uh, the school system, where would that spending be? And that's what we're going to all see. We'll see the end product of that. That is something that I will share with the city council. At the end of the day, all departments within the city will submit their budgets to myself. We'll take all those budgets, look at the funding sources and the revenues that are coming into the city. We'll develop a budget, and you'll get a chance. Um, we'll post it online. You'll get a chance to see the final budget, budget document that probably, more than likely, isn't going to look like this. And I would say... I would say that I heard a lot of optimism in this room tonight, and I would say that, and I understand people are frustrated, but as, as much energy went into um, sort of the, what we did tonight as we did towards um, finding a solution for this problem, because it's really going to be a result of everybody sort of working together and somehow or another contributing to resolving the problem. And that's how it's going to get resolved. The deficit is extremely high and it's extremely big. And as you saw, by raising property taxes by 2.5%, that's what you bring in, so it's a math decision here. At the end of the day, um, it's going to take everybody here, everybody that was in this room tonight and more, to resolve this. And the answers are here. The answers are here to resolve this. Yes. Oh, uh, okay. Thank you. I, I don't. I don't. I, I listened to everything that everybody had to say. I sat here the whole night. I answered all my emails today. I answered all my text messages. Anybody that called me today, called them back, and um, I'll continue to do so. Okay. Anything else from the school committee members? I have a family member that's in the hospital, okay? Oh, and I came here tonight. All right. And I have two family members. And I came here tonight, and I had to communicate, and I had to communicate, okay? All right. Okay. Yeah. Respectful is... Okay, anything else? Okay, motion to adjourn. All in favor? Thank you for coming tonight.